Common rollers light. Uh, yes sir. Uh, mute mute kar do sabko and make the make the panelist as co-host. Panelists are uh, co-host. I'll mute everybody and they'll not be able to unmute. Uh, others will not be able to unmute themselves. Okay, so uh, host and co-host can unmute themselves. We can start it now, sir. I'll share the screen. Uh, good evening. Again, we are starting in time. Uh, this is the 21st edition of Thursday Musings. Next slide, please. Once again, my pleasure to welcome Dr. Tofan Pati, sir. He's a professor of psychiatry uh, at Katak. Uh, he has shown his organizational skills by organizing ANSIPS twice, private psychiatry conference, industrial psychiatry. He's hosting this Saturday. So you're all invited there. He has been formerly vice chairperson IPP, president of IPS, East Zone and Odisha branch, editor of Industrial Psychiatry Journal, and many other accolades. He has winner of Madhu Sabiman and Four Avenues of Service Award. Uh, sir, hand over to you, Tufan, sir. Thank you, thank you, Aleem. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. And now I have to introduce the two stalwarts of this program. Dr. Amrit Patojoshi and Dr. Alim Siddiqui, the moderators. Dr. Amrit Patojoshi is from Bhubaneswar and he's a professor and consultant neuropsychiatrist in High Tech Medical College, Amri Hospital in Healing Trust Clinic. He's a direct council member of IPS and he's the editor of Odisha Journal of Psychiatry, which is indexed. He has the chief coordinator of UNICEF, WHO and IPS initiative on telemedicine on psychosocial management during COVID-19. Welcome, Amrit, and equally vibrant, Dr. Alim, Sid Dr. Alim Siddiqui from Lucknow, Nawawaki Nagar, Lucknow. He's the Director of Healthy Minds Neuropsychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Center. He's the Visiting Professor of Psychiatry in Eras Lucknow Medical College and GSP Medical College, Kanpur. He's also a Direct Council Member of IPS. He's the Guest Faculty to Amit University, Lucknow. He's the Financial Secretary of IMA Lucknow Branch and also IAPPUP, Uttarakhand chapter of Indian Association of Private Psychiatry. Welcome both of you. Now I have to introduce my dear friend, good friend, with a signature smile, that much I will tell. Dr. Ajit Fide from Bangalore. He is the past president of Indian Psychiatric Society <clears throat> and his major achievements include, he presented two score lectures and workshops in CME programs. Recipient of two oration awards from the IPS in which he has served many capacities. Conducted several seminars and workshops on life skills, communication and stress prevention and management. Published 17 papers in national and international journals. He is the literary editor of I Indian Journal of Psychiatry. And he is a present resignation affiliation. He is head department of psychiatry and family medicine at St. Martha's Hospital, Bangalore. He is an alumnus of St. John's Medical College and Nimans, Bangalore. He has served on faculty of both these institutions. He is an eminent psychiatrist from IPS Karnataka. Welcome, Ajit. And sure. your photograph is also with that smile. OK. Next one, please. Dr. Sagar Lavanya, a young dynamic psychiatrist who is professor in HOD Psychiatry of FS Medical College, Agra. He was previously associate professor of psychiatry in SN Medical College, Agra. He has Don is post graduation from CIP Ranchi. He has multiple paper presentations in journal and national level psychiatry conferences, numerous articles in peer reviewed journals, multiple awards over the years. And he, the awards are award from Indian Council of Medical Research for a non ICMR scientist in the year 2010. Anil Kumar, that award for the best poster title, social networking associated with deliberate self harm at IAPP annual meeting in Jammu, travel award from W W World Foundation of Societies of Biological Psychiatry, the present paper in World Congress in Prague. Anil Kumar Dutt Award for the best poster best poster again. Japanese Society of Psychiatry and Neurology Fellowship Award for presentation of the 108th annual meeting at Sapporo, May 12th. 
The International Bashari Cum Travel Award, Royal College of Psychiatry for presentation in annual meeting in Liverpool. And he has got many international and national laurels to him. Welcome, Sagar. Welcome, Dr. Lavania. And now I hand over the meetings to the chairperson, Dr. Lavania and Dr. Fide. And we have with us Shukanna for the second time to speak on Cupid's wrath. Welcome, everybody. Over to Lavania and Dr. Fide. Hi, so Dr. Sagar called me earlier this evening and we chopped up the cake between us. Of course, the prize piece of the cake will, of course, be with Dr. Sukanya. So I thought I'd speak about, I mean, we thought that I'd speak about the uh, topic and then uh, Dr. Lavanya will introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening. So this is a country where domestic violence is rampant. And domestic violence really is a very big basket, which includes uh, various things, including child abuse within the family. It uh, also includes elder abuse, to which we have become lately a little more sensitive. But most importantly, it very often, unfortunately, is equated. It's, it's, it's a cover title for what we are focusing on today, that is intimate partner violence. Violence against the spouse, and it is overwhelmingly the female spouse against whom the violence occurs, but we must be, take cognizance of the fact that uh, violence against the husband is not unknown, as a, the husband or the male partner in a relationship. We are not here to be medieval and impose middle-class morality uh, over here and uh, insist on it being only in the context of marriage. As we are seeing in urban India, that there are more and more relationships uh, of different kinds and uh, between the two life partners. Of course, same-sex unions are also being uh, seen more commonly now. But our focus today is generally an intimate partner violence. So whether uh, it's, it's the male partner or the female partner in a diet, it doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, we are addressing the entire gamut, I presume, Dr. Sakanya. Now, violence of this nature can take various forms. It can be very subtle as in the form of uh, psychological or emotional violence in the form of passive aggressive behavior by a partner, withdrawal from uh, sexual intimacy by a partner. It can take the form of emotional abuse. It can take the form of physical abuse. It can take the form very much of sexual abuse. And using sex as a weapon within the context of a marriage is another form of intimate partner uh, violence that we encounter. Dr. Sukanya will be looking at this from the lens of trauma and I'm quite intrigued by that title. By the way, it's a very, very catchy title that has been given to today's presentation, Cupid's Wrath. And uh, Cupid, of course, we know is uh, in our Indian equivalent is uh, Madan Mohan, the, the archer, the uh, god of love, the god of romantic love, actually. And when you are struck by his arrow, then uh, you are, you're done for in a sense. But that is a gentle way of putting something which can be quite devastating as our topic today clearly suggests. Now, the concept of husband and wife, the hu husband was somebody who, uh, the word comes from uh, householder, the one, the one who owns the house, the one who runs the house. And therefore, economically, it was considered that he is the superior partner in the diet. And the wife is the one who tends to the house. And that etymologically, this is very interesting. In our own country, we have words that have been uh, given great uh, gravity through their intensity because you speak of Pati Dev, he's a god. As a husband, he's a god. And then you have Dharam Patni, the one who abides by the Dharma in fulfilling the needs of the Pati. Patni means of the Pati. So as it is as though she has no independent existence. It is only because she is the holder of the Dharma within the household. And this is borne out across the world almost every culture, there are exceptions, but they are few and far between, where the husband is the dominant, uh, granted dominance as the partner in the diet. And uh, this gives rise to what we've seen the world over, the phenomenon of patriarchy. And patriarchy, to a great extent, determines why there is so much of this uh, intimate partner violence directed from the male towards the female. And this is a lot of learned behavior that is involved in this. A boy sees his father behaving with his mother in a particular way. At a very young age, if he picks this up, that the, that the relationship is based on subduing the 
uh, life partner by by his father then he picks up that cue and internalizes it very very often there are exceptions where negative modeling can take place that a boy can grow up saying that gosh my father treated my brother so badly i will never ever do this in my life and we know this example applies for example to alcoholism where somebody may grow up to be a very uh, uh, devoted teetotaler and campaign against alcohol because he's seen his father being an alcoholic but those are really exceptions by and large these cues are picked up by young children and it is believed that this is culturally sanctioned and it goes on perpetuating itself generation after generation that is a tragedy in this country we have had instances of very erudite learned uh, men i will not take names over here but we've had instances where in their families there has been people who've written books about the sociology of india have also in their own houses allowed intimate partner violence not only to thrive to go on to a point of murder and suicide this is this is really a tragic set of circumstances and i'm sure that dr sukanya will be addressing many of these issues as we go along as a final footnote may i add and this is a well known fact that with the pandemic attending on our lives i won't say devastating our lives but certainly taking a huge toll on our mental peace uh, we know that such confining circumstances like the pandemic bring with them an increase in uh, uh, domestic violence of various kinds not the least intimate partner violence and this is recorded uh, this is reported recorded across the world and our country is absolutely no exception to this it's complicated by the use of alcohol it's complicated by poverty it's complicated by uh, limitations of other resources but there we are we have a huge mountain of intimate partner violence i won't stand between you and our learned speaker today uh, but i would invite dr sagar lavanya to introduce uh, our speaker dr sukanya sagar over to thank you, you. minister sir Yeah. No, eh, no, but there. No, eh. Thank, thank you, Doctor Binder sir. Binder, nahi hai, boy. Binder, sir. Binder, sir. Binder, sir. Okay. Uh, sorry, sir. Joe Biden and I have something thank in common. We have four letters in common. Okay. Thank you to the organizers of uh, this uh, wonderful webinar. Actually, this topic is very new to lot of people who are uh, attending this. I have circulated the topic and. lot of uh, audience my friends have said that we haven't heard about this topic and they were very curious and i am sure they are joining and listening to this uh, so thank you to the organizers for organizing this wonderful topic and thank you to ajit bindhe sir for uh, giving me the pity cake uh, without wasting time i will come to the introduction of the speaker our young and dynamic clinical psychologist sukanya ray from mumbai she is clinical psychologist mphil and msc she has done assist she is assistant professor in school of human ecology tata institute of social science mumbai principal investigator of research project on the psychological impact of covid 19 in mumbai she is a member of american psychological association she is practicing psychotherapist for last uh, 15, 14 years and freelancer writer also external uh, reviewer of for the international journal of social psychiatry published by sage journal she is trained in cbt humanistic existential and systemic therapies areas of research are trauma adaptation perfectionism and suicidality online addiction and online transgression she has a previous experience of, of being an assist assistant professor in mit university madhyapur Paul, she is a consultant in human dynamic Asian Pacific uh, in India. So this is the. So we have already been hearing about uh, this violence from from a long time. If you if you see that, Dol uh, Gawar Shudra Pashu Nari, Safal Taran Ke Adhikari. So. Violence against uh, females have been justified by all these things in the past, but we as a society and we have a as a psychiatrist and psychologist as a learned society have already rejected this. And let's see how far our speaker justifies this uh, non-violent behavior. 
not being violent and still uh, marriage as you see there are two kind of marriage successful marriage and a non successful marriage so successful marriage is not about ruptures is about ability to repair when rupture occurs with these words i will ask my speaker to take up the topic and uh, thank you very much thank you dr lavania uh, thank you to the organizers and honorable chairpersons uh, for the wonderful introduction and uh, for having me on board here uh, for this topic um of course being a trauma therapist uh, this is a topic close to my heart um so before i begin i just want to um sort of um, you know stand across a disclaimer that aside from being a clinical psychologist and a trauma therapist uh, i am also a liberal feminist so you will see glimpses of that in my work as a psychotherapist as well um and of course this um this topic is quite relevant in today's times um and i will be covering parts of that as well so i'll just begin slide sharing and uh, i'll switch off my video cuz my bandwidth can play up a little bit uh, i'll be back again on screen at, at the end of the presentation for the question answer session uh, once again thank you so much uh, for organizing this topic and having me here i am not an expert in ipv but in my practice i do see individuals and couples with history of uh, intimate partner violence with a trauma focused approach however my clientele is uh, the you know my practice that i currently am in my clientele predominantly belongs to middle socio economic status or high middle socio economic status or high socio economic status um, but i also indirectly get to see clients from the low socio economic status uh with instances of ipv through supervision experiences um i also teach courses on inter um, intimate partner violence and trauma therapy at tiss um and to begin with this topic i just want to bring our attention to the fact that this is indeed a sensitive topic and um, can be a little triggering at times so i just want to invite your caution to that please exercise um self compassion and take some time off if any of this might be triggering for you one google search on love and relationship throws up a plethora of beautiful quotes on this emotion my favorite one is the one that we hear in the film interstellar love is the one thing we are capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space maybe we should trust that even if we can't understand it we think spend hurt and create so much for this one powerful emotion what would we be as a race without this emotion that drives the world around quite literally we are dependent on love to the extent that we mostly are desperate for it sometimes the desperation can lead to things to go wrong terribly wrong today's musing today's thursday musing is an attempt to look at people who are love struck and struck by love in a game of power and control the intention is to cast a compassionate therapeutic outlook at both the survivor and the perpetrator through the trauma lens to define domestic violence and intimate partner violence domestic violence refers to any form of violence or power and control between one family member and another and this includes child and elder abuse as well as our honorable chairperson stated just a while back intimate partner violence has been defined by who in in slightly different versions um in one document who defines it as one of the most common forms of violence against women clearly um citing it as a gender based violence and includes physical sexual and emotional abuse and controlling behaviors by an intimate partner in another document 
the WHO states that intimate partner violence refers to behavior by an intimate partner or ex-partner that causes physical, sexual, or psychological harm, including physical aggression, sexual coercion, psychological abuse, and controlling behaviors. Here, the reference to IPV being a gender-based violence is not drawn. However, in different places, there are research, there is empirical evidence that women are as violent as men in intimate relationships. And in many other places, we also find that women are cited as being violent only in self-defense. Earlier, the terminologies of batterers and battered women have now changed to survivors and perpetrators, but the gender labels have still stuck on. Gender-based violence, according to the UN, is defined as an act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, or mental harm or suffering to women, including threats of such acts, coercion, or arbitrary deprivation of liberty, whether occurring in public or in private life. IPV is referred to, like I said, that mostly it is referred to as a category of gender-based violence, as a category of domestic violence, and it refers to the kind of violent behavior that may occur between two intimate partners. The legal frameworks that IPV pertains to, apart from the Dowry uh, Prohibition Act, Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act 2005, that clearly entails the behaviors that are punishable under the act. Harms or injuries or endangers the, the health, safety, life, limb, or well-being whether mental or physical of the aggrieved person or tends to do so and includes causing physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal and emotional abuse and economic abuse or harasses, harms, injures and endangers the aggrieved person with a view to coerce her or any other person related to her to meet any unlawful demand for any dowry or other property or valuable security has the effect of threatening the aggrieved person or any person related to her by any conduct mentioned in clause A or clause B, or otherwise injures or causes harm, whether physical or mental, to the aggrieved person. As we clearly see that intimate partner violence or IPV is just not about physical abuse. It includes physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, economic as well. So it encompasses mental and physical abuse. When we look at prevalence, one in every three ever partnered women worldwide report IPV. In the context of India, 31% of Indian women have experienced IPV at some point in their lives. And according to WHO document, 13 to 16% have experienced physical violence from their intimate partners in their lifetime. That's, that's a world statistic. And according to a recent uh, article, there has been an increase of 1.8 fold in domestic violence during lockdown. However, as we see that in common parlance, whenever the word IPV comes up, the only association we come across is with physical violence. However, forgetting that the psychological impact is probably much, much more than the physical impact lasts longer than the physical impact. Survivors often end up with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Survivors often complain of psychological symptoms, vague somatic complaints, which may not be picked up by physicians who our clients might be going to initially because of the importance of the physical impact over the psychological impact. Yet physical abuse gets much more prominence, especially by clinicians, and that's why this topic is pertinent for today. I think it's important to understand the psychological impact of the nature of IPV, both in men and women, and to be able to pick up those signs so that we can attend to these, uh, to these individuals who's, who are love-struck and whose lives have gone terribly wrong. The work on IPV really began with Lenore Walker's The Cycle of Abuse in the 1970s. And um, Walker talks about three stages or three phases of IPV, of intimate partner violence. And when we look at this definition of IPV, 
we are looking at a cycle that perpetuates and it is this cycle that can be identified in what the client brings to their session to their in their stories it begins with the tension building phase where both the partners feel anxious or feels that there is a need to avoid or withdraw uh, from the from the perpetrator from the um, from the act of violence and this phase can be very frightening for people experiencing the abuse or the survivor they feel as though the situation will explode if anything goes wrong if they do something wrong have we lost sukanya am i audible hello yes you are audible then uh, she okay. is there yeah. yeah am i audible now yes okay all right i'm not sure till where i was uh, heard so i was in the tension building phase where yeah, i was you describing are, you were audible throughout i think okay. i'm the all right all right thank you so in the tension building phase both partners are reportedly anxious one partner who is the perpetrator might be sensitive might be actually nitpicking on the um, on the survivor or um, on the victim so to say i i try to avoid the word victim so that's why i refer to uh, the client as survivor um might be engaging in, in yelling or withholding affection or puts down the partner or threatens um the partner in some ways and usually the survivor's response is to be frightened or attempt or you know they attempt to calm the partner down tries to reason with them tries to satisfy with them with um materials like food etc or tries to avoid it in some way this is the tension building phase because both partners are acutely aware of the fact that an explosion is overdue and that's exactly what happens in phase 2 the peak of the violence is reached in this phase the perpetrator whose uh, you know the the violence was building within the tension was building within now experiences a sense of release of that tension and for the survivor of course um this is a time to seek safety this is a time to uh, to still try to probably um ally with the with the uh, with the partner to calm them down or to engage in a fight or flight response from here the couple moves to the honeymoon phase here usually at this point the perpetrator starts to feel ashamed in some ways they may become withdrawn they may try to justify their actions to themselves and others for example they may say you know it makes me angry when you say that so in this phase the abuser or the perpetrator tries to soften their stance tries to um soften the the abuse that has been inflicted as well during this pursuit phase the perpetrator may promise to never be violent again they may try to explain the violence by blaming on other factors such as alcohol or other stresses the perpetrator may be very attentive to the person experiencing the violence including overcompensatory behaviors like buying gifts and helping around the house it could seem as though the perpetrator has changed at this point the person experiencing the violence can feel confused and hurt but also relieved that the violence is over in the denial phase both people in the relationship may be in denial and about the severity of the abuse and violence and this is where we see that both partners are in a shared fantasy of sorts intimacy can increase during this phase it's almost as if the violence never happened both people may feel happy and want the relationship to continue so they may not acknowledge the possibility that the violence could happen again and this is what perpetuates the cycle of ipp Walker was the first to identify this, and in all our clients coming to us with stories of intimate partner violence, we are likely to identify this cycle of violence, and it is important that we do so. We might even be able to identify how many cycles our client has gone through. What I intend to do today is take you through one of 
um, one of our clients, one of my clients presenting with IPV, a slightly different presentation than what we might think in terms of physical violence or in terms of um, domestic violence, you know, so to say, or acute sexual violence. We look at a case example where probably there's more psychological violence, more emotional trauma that is being meted out. At this juncture, it's very important to understand the types of in, uh, intimate partner violence that may exist. Now, as per severity, IPV can be classified in different ways. It can be classified as level one to level three, depending upon the kind of abuse that goes on. But Kelly and Johnson have identified four different types of IPV, which are qualitatively different. And this really helps in understanding the dynamic in the relationship, the context, the consequences, and plan for treatment as well. The first of this type is called characterological or coercive controlling violence. The second one is called violent resistance. This usually refers to the violence that we see in, in women, women partners or female partners, where they try to resist the violence that is happening in the relationship. The third kind, situational couple violence, and the characterological violence is what I will elaborate further. The separation instigated violence is again a kind of violence that, it's, that can be seen in both partners upon being separated. So this is something which is not characterological at all. It is not something which is characteristic of the partner. There is another fifth, fifth type, mutual violent control, which Johnson came up in 2006, uh, where um, mutual violent control refers to both partners having characterological uh, violence, basically characterized by a lot of power and control issues. However, this category has not received a lot of empirical evidence. So we stick to the four types. Out of these four types, it is critical to differentiate between characterological and situational couple violence because this forms the basis of our understanding, our case conceptualization and treatment planning. To differentiate these two, I have just put together some points here, um, some overall points that helps us identify whether this is situational IPV or characterological IPV. Situational IPV usually does not involve a dynamic of power or control. It may be related to usually anger dysregulation in one or both partners. Jealousy may or may not be present. And usually situational IPV is found or in both genders. And usually it is not accompanied by the fear of the partner. Um, um, you know, it is, it's not usually there that the female partner is expressing fear about the male partner. It may involve verbal aggression, but rarely does involve any physical aggression. Even if it does, it's usually uh, contained till pushing, shoving, grabbing. In situational IPV, conjoint couples therapy is indicated. Characterological IPV, on the other hand, involves the dynamic of power and control. That is, a, that is the central dynamic that is noticeable in characterological IPV. Yet, it may not always involve high levels of violence. It may not always involve physical violence. It may not even involve a lot of yelling or shouting. But definitely what underlies this kind of IPV is the dynamic of power and control. It is usually perpetrated by males on females in heterosexual relationships. It usually escalates over time and the psychological effect may be much more than the physical impact. Conjoint couples therapy is contraindicated in characterological IPV because it may worsen the violence. Coming to the power and control wheel, which is something that was, which is a model that was given by Pence and Paymar and forms the central feature of the Duluth model as well. Uh, this shows the various ways in which usually characterological violence is perpetuated. Um, power and control here refers to, like I said, that it refers to usually the power and control that is exerted by a male partner on a female partner in a heterosexual relationship. So using intimidation, using some sort of um, behaviors to, to show her the kind of control they may have over the environment, smashing things, destroying her property, abusing her pets or displaying any sort of weapon. So any sort of intimidation 
um, by engaging in violent behaviors is one such way of exerting power and control. Another way can be using emotional abuse. So a lot of blaming, um, making her feel bad about herself, calling her names, making her think she's crazy, body shaming, playing, playing mind games, humiliating her, making her feel guilty. Associated with that are other behaviors, which, which we sometimes refer to as gaslighting behaviors, minimizing, denying, and blaming, making light of the abuse or not taking her concerns about it seriously, um, denying that the abuse ever happened, shifting the responsibility onto her, saying that she caused it. Sometimes even children can be used to make her feel guilty um, about how she's not being able to um, cater to her children and that's what makes the partner violent using children to relay messages um, scapegoating the child or you know a kind of like a switchboard communication pattern may be adopted uh, using visitation rights to harass her threatening to take the child away so these are all instances where um, we know that how children can also be witness to, to IPV and how they might be pulled into the dynamic as well using male privilege um, so basically making her run errands and um, having the control over major decisions for both the partners, um, acting like the master of the house, being the one to define roles for him and her, using economic abuse, so preventing her from getting or keeping a job, making her ask for every penny that she wants to use, giving her an allowance, taking her money, not letting her know about or have access to family income using threats, um, using threats to make her do some um, activities, uh, threatening to leave her to commit suicide or report her to welfare or, you know, um, probably setting her up um, in, in some kind of illegal activities, uh, make her drop charges as well. All of these are different ways in which the male partner can be exerting power and control over the female partner. That's not to say that the same does not happen the other way around, vice versa. It does happen, although uh, the empirical research shows that um, usually in a heterosexual relationship, the power and control is exerted from the male towards the female. Isolation can also be used and as another way of exerting power and control, controlling whatever she does who she sees, who she befriends, who she talks to, where she goes, what she reads, what you know, whatever she's spending on, uh, limiting her involvement with friends, family, using jealousy to justify actions. <coughs> so this power and control wheel is at the central feature of um, characterological IPV. The trauma lens here departs a little bit from the characterological lens because the characterological lens can sometimes <coughs> Excuse me. The characterological lens can sometimes um, blame the entire IPV on, you know, sort of demonizing the male. But the trauma lens allows us to look at the perpetrator as just another survivor, as another individual who may have survived other forms of violence, maybe in childhood, maybe in other contexts and is just reenacting that trauma in the intimate relationship. The, the trauma lens also helps look at both the perpetrator and the survivor. Um, as we know that the attachment style is an important concept in trauma therapy, that uh, the way we form our attachment bonds, whether that is preoccupied, these are the three types of insecure attachment style, preoccupied, dismissive, and disorganized attachment. The kind of um, dysfunctional attachment style that may, may have been developed to the caregiver is usually um, continued in the adult intimate relationship and individuals tend to reenact the same attachment bond in intimate relationships. And um, depending on the kind of bond that usually partners would have had with the opposite gender parent, that would be played out in the intimate relationship. Of course, this comes from um, a psychodynamic school of thought, but the trauma lens um, attaches great importance to attachment style and how the attachment can be reenacted and healed in the therapy context. There's a huge role of transgenerational trauma in understanding IPV and even characterological IPV. When we look at the IFS model, Internal Family Systems Therapy Model by Richard Schwartz, um, he talks about personal burdens and legacy burdens. Legacy burdens are almost like those unconscious uh, learnings the, that are 
that are uh, pushed on from family, culture, ethnic groups, nationality. There are four types of legacy burdens that he talks about. Racism, patriarchy, individualism, and materialism. Out of this, patriarchy and individualism are known to perpetuate burdens that push males towards violence in, 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 um, I, in intimate relationships. These, um, the, you know, we all have paths, and that's the entire premise of IFS, that all our paths and the, and the wounded paths are the paths that are carrying these legacy burdens and are being pushed into roles. These roles have literally helped the individual survive. And that learning can sometimes push these paths to extreme forms of behavior. And that's what we see in, in some forms of IPV, in characterological violence, in characterological um, IPV. Transgenerational trauma therefore informs us that we need to look for um, what kind of legacy burdens are being handed over uh, from the family or culture or ethnic groups that the individual belongs to? What kind of learnings have shaped their beliefs about gender, about their um, about male privilege, about individualism as well? Another very important um, perspective in understanding IPV is the concept of narcissistic abuse. Many uh, researchers who are working on narcissistic abuse or in narcissism um, talk about how narcissism is sort of increasing both in prevalence and popularity as well in our current um, civilization. Narcissism is looked at as a defense mechanism, a response to trauma, um, ch childhood trauma, of course. So it's essentially a kind of complex PTSD that we are looking at when we look at someone with uh, personality disorders, the cluster B personality disorders, we are essentially looking at someone with complex PTSD. Narcissistic abuse also is reflected in intimate relationships and it begins usually with um, the, the male partner doting on the female partner. Um, usually the male partner tries to um, befriend a female who typically has father issues and begins to literally father the partner, begins to literally dote on the partner so much, you know, sort of tries to be the father that the female partner would have never had. After a while, the father in the partner disappears and the partner then is tested for her loyalty and her fate to be a good enough mother because the narcissist's trauma has come from their relationship with their mother. This is the first level of narcissistic abuse that is that has been noticed by researchers. And um, the second level of narcissistic abuse is noticed when the partner can be discarded because the partner can no longer, has not proved to be a good enough mother. Um, the work of Behari, who is a schema-focused therapist, also talks about overt and covert narcissism. Overt narcissism is um, quite prominent where uh, we see a lot of pronounced male privilege being enacted in behaviors. Covert narcissism might not be so prominent, but at the same time um, expresses that need to manipulate in int intimate partner, in intimate relationships. There are several types that Bihari um, points out. There can be the spoiled child, the dependent child, the lonely deprived child, and um, a mixed bag known as spoiled dependent and deprived dependent. Narcissistic abuse might be noticed in several degrees in intimate uh, partners and in intimate relationships. And it's important to understand that narcissistic abuse may be very difficult to treat. And even though characterological violence can be treated with trauma, narcissistic abuse may pose as a severe challenge to treat. Um, therefore, it's important to not only um, understand the type of uh, IPV that we are looking at, but also look at what other forms of comorbidity are we are we seeing in our clients. Of course, we know that there are several risk factors, uh, low socioeconomic status, um, substance use, and um, history of domestic violence in the family of origin. These are all risk factors uh, that tell us that you know, there is definitely um, a, a chance that this might be a difficult um, client to treat, and that's where trauma therapy uh, comes to our aid. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to start presenting the client's history a little bit, and I'll be taking up a few concepts, a few theoretical concepts to elaborate on that as we go ahead. 
So this is the story of Kritika and Rakesh. I've been seeing them for therapy for the last six months. They've been married for 10 years. They're in their early 40s. Both are software engineers working in the same company. Um, if I may call them the typical uh, double income, no kids couple. Kritika lost her mother two months into the marriage. That would be 10 years back. And ever since then, her father has been staying with them off and on. She has a sibling who is married and lives in another city. She has a sister. Uh, Rakesh's parents dote on Kritika. They consider her to be um, the ideal um, wife for Rakesh, the ideal daughter-in-law for their home. His sibling is also married and lives in another city with his parents. Kritika loves cooking, spends her time finishing house chores, managing the office, her dad, and most other executive roles in the household. Rakesh has complete control over finances, including her income. All their purchase, purchasing is done together, with um, Kritika not having control on her internet banking either. Rakesh insists she is not smart enough to handle finances and he tallies every little detail of spends onto, a, onto an Excel sheet that he maintains um, very critically. Kritika contacted the therapist for an individual session. However, when she turned up, um, Rakesh turned up with her for the first session, insisting that the reason that Kritika sought help was to work on their marriage. Both expressed that they wanted to save their marriage. Now, in the first conjoint session, many parts of the couple came alive. The couple openly shared the current status of their marriage. Um, majorly, the, the narrative was led by Rakesh. They revisited their early days in the relationship. Um, they narrated how they met, uh, about their short courtship period, which was just for about nine months. And uh, while narrating it, Rakesh was noticed to be tearful, talking about the bond that they have always shared in the initial days. Uh, when they were setting up house um, with the very little finances that usually a couple starts with. Uh, they also shared how they how they met at their workplace. And um, Kritika also shared how in the early days, Rakesh was the most romantic partner she could have ever wanted. Kritika talked about how their bond was deep and has endured so much of unconventional trauma. Kritika was tearful and welled up several times while talking about how she sits through Rakesh's drinking sessions to give him company and to ensure that he's safe because she has to drive him back. Her awareness of her state, of that state when she was relating this, was that she felt so much of love for him to still care about him deeply despite all the troubles and the recent betrayal. Rakesh spoke of how he enjoyed alcohol and never plans to get inebriated especially since his father-in-law objects and is not aware of his consumption. However, his usual intake would be close to six or seven pegs on an average of thrice a week. Yet he denied that he is dependent on alcohol. Rakesh had started drinking regularly since his post-graduation days in the USA. After three years of marriage, Rakesh slowly relapsed into his previous pattern of use. So when they got married, he was not consuming alcohol frequently. Uh, Kritika has strong beliefs regarding alcohol use and on many occasions had asked Rakesh to quit or go for rehab. She insists that Rakesh and his parents had not informed her of her drinking before the marriage. There have been several instances of Rakesh getting into trouble due to drinking under influence or losing valuables. He lost a laptop, he lost several phones because he was inebriated and, gave, and Kritika was not around to take him home. Since then, they decided as a couple that whenever Rakesh would want to drink outside, usually, it would be in the presence of Kritika so that she could drive him back. So this became the equilibrium of sorts. For the last five years, this, uh, this perpetuated, this pattern perpetuated. At home, he would often drink, um, mess up the room completely because, um, you know, he, he would have other food items with uh, alcohol, so he would mess up the room completely and Kritika would have to clean up the whole mess, no matter the time of the day. Several times under influence, Rakesh had made sexual advances and uh, sexual requests to Kritika as well. On most occasions, she had complied despite her lack of willingness to prevent him from making too much noise and wake up her dad. Since the past five years, and this is the part where the couple 
um, took some time to come forth with it, but it was the first um, session itself that they um, talked to me about this. Since the past five years, Kritika and Rakesh are unknowingly in an open marriage. Rakesh has given her the rights to see other men and has reserved the right for himself to enter into sexual, emotional relationships with other women. The context for this arrangement is the couple's lack of physical intimacy. Both report that the, the nature of physical intimacy has not been that great and therefore they have given each other the rights to see other partners. Kritika seems ambivalent about it and feels that this is perhaps the only way to keep the marriage going. They both seem very intent on working on the marriage. She also feels that Rakesh is a benevolent man since she has had minor flings with a couple of men and he has not objected to it. Since the last 1.5 years, Rakesh has entered into an extra dyadic relationship with another lady, even though they have no long-term plans. Pritika not only knows about it, but she has also had to engage under question from Rakesh to communicate with her. Nine months back, one fine day, Rakesh announced to Kritika while on a long drive that he was love struck with the other lady and he wanted to give the relationship a shot. So he asked for a divorce. Kritika agreed, decided, that's when she decided to reach out for a therapist for herself. Yet within days, within five days, Rakesh came back to Kritika saying that he had changed his mind and wanted to work on the marriage. He promised that he would cut ties with the other lady. But when I probed further, it seemed that two similar instances had occurred two years back. So it pretty much looked like they had had three cycles of abuse. So when we look at the central dynamic of this couple, it's quite clear that there's a, there's, there are clear power and control is, issues, thereby letting us know that this is characterological IPV that we are looking at. And we could see that how uh, he was trying to exert control over the sessions as well. And if we can identify the power and control, both in, um, in emotional control, economic control, we can see gaslighting or minimizing, denying and blaming, isolating, male privilege, using intimidation. We can see several cycles of abuse, at least three that the couple had reported. The context of the marriage being that um, they were a couple with no children. Um, they, they had parental responsibilities. There were strong social roles. They had to keep up with the social roles that they had created for themselves. Financial needs, um, of course, because Kritika was not earning enough to run the show by herself. So she was dependent on Rakesh for finance as well. Uh, it was quite clear from what I heard from Kritika in, in the next few sessions about her complex PTSD. Um, the consequences of this dynamic, as we see, is that there's a lot of enabling the addiction behavior, Rakesh is drinking. Um, so as also we see that there's a lot of what we call codependence here. Um, fulfilling social roles, minimization of parental conflict. So the social roles were being fulfilled at the cost of, um, you know, not being able to satisfy each other, not being able to work with the, with the marital issues. And at the same time, that, that was also serving the purpose of keeping the parental conflicts at a minimum. So the parts that then show up had to show up in individual sessions. And of course, because there was characterological violence, uh, conjoint sessions would not, uh, conjoint couple therapy would not work. So I immediately called them for individual couple therapy sessions. So in, in, their, in her individual sessions, uh, Kritika shared her love for driving and going for trips alone, all by herself. She loved driving. It gave her a sense of empowerment and gave her a sense of um, emancipation. And that was something that she really liked. However, she felt scared of talking about it in front of Rakesh, since it would invite him to accuse her of being distant and too independent and not involving her in most things. And he would continue to helicopter more around her. So these are the parts of Kritika that I saw in the individual session that didn't come up in the couple sessions because of the obvious fear that she had of him. She felt violated, insulted, and angry for having forced by Rakesh to speak with his lady love. She shared that every time she had to sit through his drinking session, she had to be cool. While she was sometimes aware of how restless and anxious she felt inside, most of the time she reported that it had become a ritual. She would just feel numb and she would just go through it as a ritual. So was the case for the little sexual intimacy that would happen. Um, um, especially the, the sexual request that she had to keep up with. She reported feeling numb throughout those incidents as well. She recalled several occasions where uh, he had gone out for drinks alone and almost in every occasion she had to go out to fetch for him 
because he would have blacked out or lost something, got into some trouble. Um, and in one instance, she had to go out um, and in the middle of the night to fetch him and his phone had punked off and he, um, he was not to be traced. Um, she literally had to run around in the night to look for him where he was in an inebriated condition in the neighborhood. She reported feeling numb through all of this because of course this had gone on for way too long. In further sessions, she shared her memories of her childhood of her dad, who was an orthodox controlling parent and her mother who was working, but complied with her dad's discipline. One incident that she shared where um, she said that she was about seven, eight years of age and her mother was filling out a form and um, father asked her mother to sign at a particular place in the form. And her mother was about to sign where her father was reiterating to sign on a particular line or you know, to, to limit the signature to a particular space. That's when her mother, she, she recalled her mother saying that, I know how to sign. And to that, her father's response was to throw away all her mother's certificates out of the window. All, all her school certificates, all her educational certificates out of the window. And that was something that she talked about during uh, the trauma history taking. Despite the stringent disciplinary measures that were implemented on both Kritika and her sister about going out, not having male friends, not, uh, not spending too much of time outside playing, uh, she was sexually abused by one of her teachers in school. When she confided in her parents, her parents decided to confront the teacher the teacher then came home with his wife to apologize and at that point what her parents did was to decide to forgive him and drop the charges without speaking to Kritika. Kritika was about 11 years of age at that time. Since then she was put under more stringent discipline to not go out and her every move was um, kind of helicoptered by her dad. She would be dropped off and picked up, uh, picked up from school so that she wouldn't go out of sight at all. She shared that she was also overweight as a child and adolescence, and um, it was also it was only after she launched out for studies in her college days when she stayed outside her hometown that she was able to lose her weight by exercising rigorously. She had had three short-lived relationships before she met Rakesh. Kritika shared that she felt she cannot leave the marriage, even though she felt the treatment she received from Rakesh was neither what she deserved nor would it change. She feared backlash from him, her dad, who she also feared, and his parents, who she did not fear, but reported that she had intense attachment with his parents. And she felt that she would be disappointing all of them and the backlash from especially from uh, Rakesh and her dad would be very, very, um, you know, something that she, she couldn't even bring herself to imagine that. I want to bring your attention to the concept of codependence here. Codependence works like a lock and key mechanism. So we see how Ritika's um, sitting, Ritika's sitting through the um, drinking sessions was acting as an enabling behavior for his drinking. He knew that there would be someone to picking up, uh, pick him up. He knew that there would be someone to drive him back home. He knew that there would be someone to clean up his mess. In, through all of that, she was actually perpetuating his dysfunctional behaviors. This perpetuated the equilibrium. It also resulted in a lot of shame and self-blame on her part that how whatever she was doing was just not enough. Um, it, also, um, it also shows how Kritika was also dependent on Rakesh for several things. For example, her finances. Rakesh had conveniently called her very poor at handling finances and had taken complete control of finances. Every single uh, 10 rupee that she would have to spend on anything, she would have to account for it to him. And um, this also perpetuated in several other areas of life where a lot of control was exerted and, and uh, Kritika also felt that uh, she didn't have to, for example, tax filings, etc. She didn't have to feel responsible for it. So this codependence pattern acted as a strong um, factor in the equilibrium. It perpetuated the equilibrium, enabled the addictive behavior and enabled the dysfunctional behaviors as well as we see. In his individual sessions, Rakesh shared his love for details, almost to the point that it had me thinking whether he had OCD. 
but it seemed that his OCD symptoms were restricted to having a plan. He showed some anencastic traits, but they were restricted to planning. Uh, more of always having a, a backup plan. He would always have a plan B and C to anything, to everything, to, a, to his daily life even. He also shared his childhood memories of growing up in a nested, secure, gated community and how his mother used to dote on him. He was very close to his father. He reported that he was, you know, on a daily basis, he would always look out for the time when his dad would come home. He was a spoiled child in the family. He shared that he was taught to say the complete truth, even when he had made a grave mistake. According to him, this was his dad's policy. He was told that even if you make a mistake, if you just come up and tell us the whole truth um, without trying to shield any of it, you will be appreciated. You will not only be um, saved from the punishment, but you will also be appreciated for your honesty. So this is what uh, you know he literally learned to uh, to do. He would engage in certain things which would be objectionable, but then he would just come up and and owned up honestly, and he would escape punishment. His younger sibling was always um, competitive, and the two were compared in terms of every achievement. Even though Rakesh felt that he was always favored as the wittier one, he shared that at the end of his B Tech, he was unsure about what to pursue. His choice of studying maths, he always wanted to study maths. Um, he, um, he saw himself as a maths genius, but he was discouraged by his dad who had forced him to take up BTEC. And he enrolled himself for an MS in a US university along with two of his close friends. He could not complete the MS degree because he lost interest midway and he had to quit. And that was the time that his regular drinking pattern began in the US. He didn't have too many friends there. He didn't have um, much of support there. So he had to return back to India, um, back to his parents. He spent three months in a rehab. And then that's the time where he met Kritika at his first job in India. He had had three short lasting relationships while he was in USA and shared that he had almost never been without a friend or partner in his life. He always felt the need to be in a relationship on his terms. And this explains his codependence for being in a relationship. Rakesh shared that he felt drawn to the other lady because he felt a strong connection with her, something that he always wanted to see in Kritika but could never cultivate with her. And he would feel constantly rejected every time, every time Kritika would refuse to share or would close up during a conversation. He shared that after her mother passed away, uh, he had tried to make her talk. He had tried to um, sort of, you know, um, um, talk to her about the trauma that she was undergoing and share with him. She would, he would almost prod her to talk all the time and she would just distance herself. He found it difficult to break the ice and the couple also lost out on their physical intimacy around this time. He felt he was being a very open-minded partner by allowing both his wife and himself to seek sexual satisfaction outside the wedlock. Um, he, want, he felt he wanted the marriage to continue so that they could continue their social roles and not disturb the parental equilibrium. However, he was also willing to seek therapy to correct the dynamics and for Kritika to share more connection with him. However, what really persisted on his front was that throughout the six months of individual and, and couples therapy sessions, um, Rakesh was constantly in touch with the other lady and refused to give up the connection, despite Kritika's repeated requests to give it up to be able to work on the marriage. On several occasions, he made it clear that his expectation was for Kritika to accept the situation, that he was always going to be in touch with the other lady as a friend. But there have been several violations to that. Both have been regular in terms of therapy. Both have um, attended individual therapy and a few couples therapy sessions where um, the, the agenda was not to engage in um, conjoint couples therapy, but to explore more about their relationship. Kritika's codependence and trauma processing is something that uh, was taken up um, initially because the codependence was something that had to be worked at um, and, and that's also something that was giving her immense trauma almost three times in a week on an ongoing basis. Um, so on probing her state during Rakesh's drinking sessions, um, she recalled two incidents from her childhood. One in which two of her relatives died in a car accident. They had come over for dinner to her place and uh, they, they had just seen them off, barely closed the door where, you know, when there was a, a noise and the entire family went out, including herself and her sister. And a truck had run over the two relatives who had come on a two-wheeler. Two 
um, this was this was um, of course extremely traumatic for the entire family. This is something that she recalled, and there was a lot of emotional upheaval. The other incident was of her uncle, her mom's brother-in-law, uh, who died when her aunt was not in town. Apparently, these two memories were tied to um, her belief that she always needs to be there for her partner because if she's not there for her partner something bad would happen to him so it was out of that that she was she was continuously mapping his um you know he was she was continuously being there for him during um his intake sessions and would never leave his side these memories were processed with emdr eye movement desensitization and reprocessing Following that reprocessing, following successful reprocessing of these two memories specifically, Kritika began to allow, slowly allow Rakesh to go for his drinking sessions by himself. Of course, keeping certain things in mind, um, Rakesh also agreed to uh, go for his drinking sessions outside the house, uh, not at wee hours or not too late in the night. She was able to tolerate the anxiety she experienced and she was able to assert that he needs to be responsible for his drinking. So the co-dependence was slowly melting away. Trauma processing was then done uh, with Path's work for her relational trauma. She had encountered a lot of relational trauma in her previous relationships. Following this, uh, there was a clear change in her physical posture. When she had first come to the session for the first time, there was a slump. Um, you know, usually we see this um, in um, complex PTSD clients. But after the processing, her posture had changed. Her back had straightened. She reported feeling more centered. She was able to start exercising to lose weight. She had started taking care of herself. So a lot of uh, self-compassion had come in as well after uh, processing some of the relational trauma. Following this, she was introduced to the concept of the power and control uh, using a feminist psychotherapy framework. And this is when she began noticing the kind of power and control that she had been experiencing all throughout her um, marriage and even in, in her childhood as well from her dad. A month later into these sessions, she started applying for new jobs because both were in a job. The, the situation was like a deadlock where both of them were constantly with each other 24-7. He would not let her be out of his sight at all, except for the times that he was on phone with someone else. Uh, they would go to work together. They would have lunch together. They would come back together. So everything was happening together. And this was the first time that um, the couple was really sort of learning to uh, be away from each other for, uh, for some moments uh, during the day. Rakesh's trauma processing was taken up, but it was difficult because he had very low interoceptive abilities. Interoceptive abilities basically mean that um, how much the individual is able to tap into their body-mind complex, be able to notice feelings, be able to um, um, locate sensations or physical you know, elements of the emotions in the body. So that ability was quite low, indicating that he had a dismissive avoidant attachment pattern, low feeler. Um, Paths work with a somatic focus is what is usually recommended with individuals with dismissive avoidant attachment who, are, who have low interoceptive abilities. So that was done for trauma processing. Several memories from his childhood, typical small teas, how, you know, for the first time he had gone to his village home, how, um, you know, what kind of experiences he had had and how he felt abandoned several times in his village home as a child. Those kind of small teas came up. And that, that was done to crack his defense of um, constantly overdoing a cognitive defense, which was basically you know, constantly planning, constantly engaging in a lot of cognitive work. So that was the overdoing that he was um, always engaged in as a safety net for himself, because he just hadn't learned. That's what, that's what his brain had learned to survive. His brain had learned that in order to feel secure, in order to feel um, safe, he would constantly have to engage in cognitive work, planning um, something as a safety net. He had also learned that he also needs to be in relationships. He needs to have people around him all the time as a safety net. Being alone seemed almost unbearable to him. And this is something that he had, you know, you can see that through the trauma, this is something his brain, his brain had learned. It was a learned pattern. After six months of therapy, this is where the current situation is and they're still, still um, undergoing therapy. 
uh, Kritika has been able to ask Rakesh for six months of separation now. The couple has not yet decided whether they want to go ahead with individuating or uh, you know go for a uh, separation or divorce right away. They want to give it, give each other some time. They have uh, she has found herself a new job and decided to move to a new city with her dad. Of course, Rakesh wants to follow her and be there and uh, take up a job in that city. But that's something that Kritika has said that can happen after a few months of her um, thinking through this. Rakesh is still in therapy, of course, for his codependency for relationships, how uh, the safety net of relationships is important for him and how he considers being alone as absolutely something <clears throat> unbearable and Kritika sessions for processing betrayal trauma um, that has happened in the context of Rakesh's um, betrayal and her mother's loss. These are uh, the processing that is currently going on. Rakesh is still in touch with the other lady and feels that he may decide to give the relationship a chance if the marriage does not work out. So it's almost like a catch-22 situation um, with them right now. Kritika has clearly stated that she refuses to decide on continuing the marriage till he quits all ties with the other lady. So she has now been able to assert herself, her judgment about this. She has taken control of her own finances. Um, and she has also disclosed <clears throat> her decision to her dad and her sister and also her extended family. Um, Rakesh has also disclosed the situation to his family. His family is concerned if he will be able to live by himself. I just wanted to give um, the audience a little view of this um, complex interplay of trauma of two individuals and how that is that was perpetuating the uh, the violence that we noticed violence here is not noticeable like we discussed in uh, characterological violence that sometimes characterological violence may only show up in the power and control dynamic and not so much in the physical or the verbal abuse of course there was sexual abuse here um, there was betrayal here so all of that is definitely emotional abuse and sexual abuse that we see uh, no physical abuse as such not a lot of um, you know verbal abuse in that sense but we do see a lot of the other ways of power and control that was that was forming the central feature of the dynamic here i took up this um, this uh, vignette because i felt that we often uh, the moment we say ipv uh, we start thinking there would be um, alcohol use there would be wife beating there would be battering and all of that um, in such cases it's probably um, clearer for the therapist to decide that safety is first and uh, you know that's where the duluth model or the power control wheel or just deciding on how the client can be safe referring them to ngos who can sort of you know help them deal with the situation referring them to law enforcement agencies might be helpful but in such situations where the emotional trauma is so immense uh, the psychological nature of um, the trauma, the, the, the violence is, is much, much more, much, much more pronounced than um, the physical um, violence as well. This is where even our educated clients can get stuck in. And this is how trauma therapy does play a role here. These are some of the tools that have been found to be useful in screening and measuring um, intimate partner violence. The most used is the conflict tactic scale. Uh, there is a modified version and a second version also available. There is the hit screen, which is a four item scale, hurt, insult, threaten and scream. This is like a scoring system, one to five, and the scores range from four to a maximum of 20. A score of 10 or more is considered <clears throat> diagnostic of abuse. There is also the stat screen, slapped, threatened and thrown. This is a highly sensitive tool to screen IPV and uh, other similar useful tools are um, woman abuse screening tool, <coughs> uh, women's experience with battering scale, the abuse assessment scale, domestic violence survivor assessment scale. These assessment tools uh, enable clinicians um, to screen for IPV even when obvious indicators may not be there. Interventions for survivors include a lot of these therapies, including trauma therapy, especially eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Um, sorry. Um, feminist psychotherapy is something that we can always, um, you know, um, 
sort of acquaint ourselves with because apart from trauma therapy it's important to be able to not stay neutral when we are talking to the survivor of ipv uh, we must realize that personal is political these are the tenets of feminist psychotherapy the personal is political and personal and social identities are interdependent the counseling relationship is egalitarian women experiences are honored definition of distress and mental illness need to be reformulated <clears throat> away from the disease model and, and most importantly feminist psychotherapy emphasizes the importance of working against multiple oppressive forces that operate on women so uh, it's important that we have this lens as well apart from uh, trauma therapy like uh, like we saw that you know the, the power and control wheel needed to be introduced at some point for her to even acknowledge or know for clients to even understand that these forms of control are uh, prominent in intimate relationships trauma processing in um, intimate partner relationships have certain protocol especially in eye movement desensitization and reprocessing uh, there is a particular protocol that is followed because what is often found is that um, and this is in line with a lot of uh, qualitative literature which has found that women experiencing intimate partner violence have a clear recognition of the abusive relationship yet they they are yearning to be truly loved and they recognize that they are unable to detach and there is a kind of idealization that is seen in um in um, survivors of uh, intimate uh, partner violence uh, what we see is that um they are attached to the image or the or the idea of a partner who the partner is actually not and that is referred to as idealization that is caused due to dysfunctional positive emotions which blocks access uh, to them to traumatic memories and even when we are processing these kind of trauma uh that acts as a defensive mechanism <laughs> sorry about that um so that acts as a defensive mechanism and prevents access to the traumatic memories for processing and in emdr um Uh, therapists who are trained in emdr they use a specific protocol for accessing those negative memories behind the veil or defense of these positive memories couples therapy like i said is indicated for situational violence because when there is characterological violence couples therapy may only be useful for understanding the dynamic further but uh, meta analysis of couples therapy has found that um, uh, couples therapy significantly reduces ipv when there is situational violence only emotion focused couples therapy has been found to be useful and um, efficacious uh, when characterological violence is indicated couples therapy can be counterproductive hence the importance of um, being able to decipher whether it's characterological or situational violence interventions for perpetrators um psychoeducational programs uh, from a feminist uh, from from a feminist lens better intervention programs which usually are done in group model anger control and management schema therapy trauma focused approaches these are interventions for perpetrators um coming back to the concept of love where we started romantic love has been found to act as as a veil against violence and has also been found to be one of the main barriers to leave the abusive relationship the constructs of romantic love that we develop through our um, through society or through our movies through our uh, romantic literature that we uh, that we read um that actually perpetuates um being in 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 the abusive relationship love also becomes a weapon for intimate partner violence because not only is it used by the perpetrator but um the survivor is also um dependent on on the love in the relationship and that sort of becomes the weapon for the perpetrator to use romantic love and legitimization of um intimate partner violence is mediated by ambivalent sexism and domestic violence myths this has been found in recent research um women who tend to remain in an abusive relationship in qualitative research in a in a qualitative research done in 2006 the two constructs that have been found to be playing important uh, uh, role is um the desperation for being in a relationship with a uh, you know desperation for a man and interpreting jealousy as a sign of love um with that i'm i'm just going to supply you with some helplines and links uh, of ngos that uh, might be useful for referring our clients when they need any kind of 
legal interventions or social interventions, it's important um, that we have these handy. Um, with that, I end my talk. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sakanya, for a very exhaustive coverage. Uh, I must say the kind of uh, intimate partner violence here was somewhat subtle. And I'm beginning to wonder if we might, with this trauma lens, look at all cases of uh, marital therapy or marital disharmony with who come for counseling. Look at it from a framework of necessarily uh, in, uh, intimate partner violence. Because to my mind, the intimate partner violence that comes to my mind, this is very, very subtle. Also, I'm not quite convinced about the narcissism that has been attributed to this particular male partner. Uh, there, is, there are certain narcissistic traits, no doubt, but I, I, I would debate that. Uh, I don't think we have the time for uh, the details, and I'm sure this might uh, find place in the um, QA session that will uh, ensue. But the, the theoretical framework was excellent, and I really enjoyed uh, the uh, background material that was so well prepared and given a proper context. Uh, also, I don't know how many people still regard EMDR as an acceptable form of therapy because it is a little controversial to most hardcore clinicians. EMDR has the blessings of certain practitioners, but also there's a, there is a very strong lobby uh, refuting it. I'm, I'm neither for nor against not being very familiar with the practicality of it, though I know that uh, the person who advocated it has won awards and so forth. There, there is a strong academic lobby against EMDR as a scientifically valid construct to begin with. Well, not to begin with, to end with. So uh, with, with this, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to chair a very, very good presentation and a very interesting, often neglected uh, topic. Uh, over to my co-chair, Dr. Sagar Lavanya. Sagar, you are muted. Uh, we, we, take it. Yeah, I think we start the questions. Amrit. Ali, I, I'll take the first question. Sure. Just to add a few lines, Thank, uh, thank you for the comprehensive presentation, Sukanya. What I have learned through my therapy is that uh, if someone has gone through a long-term trauma, the pleasure becomes uncomfortable to them. You know, in, in a marriage, the couples can be argumentative. They can criticize each other. Sometimes they will not listen to each other. That is okay. But abuse is not okay. And to make them realize that abuse is not okay, is a problem for us. How many times I have seen in my clinic that the husband says, sir, isko ek -ek mein thokna padta hai beech mein. Tab ja ke sahi se hai. And the wife smiles on this. How to intervene this, how to say that this is not an acceptable behavior is a challenge. But I am still hopeful and optimistic with our young uh, speaker, Sukanya. Then one day we will achieve this this realization part and uh, then we can talk about management because management is, is still is limited to Mumbai and uh, New Delhi. In Agra, Mathura, it's very difficult to make them realize, but I'm still hopeful. Thank you, Sukarna, and thank you for the organizers. Over to Amrit thank and Ali. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Th thank you, Dr. Sagar. Uh, your comment was well taken because many times we see you know, the kids are complaining that their mothers are being abused by the fathers, but the mothers are smiling and telling, no, no, it's okay, you don't have to interfere. We are quite comfortable with what is happening around us. You know, so just just taking from a cue from there, how would your approach change if the couple had a kid or two kids? What would your approach be different? I think that might change the context, um, you know, considerably, like, um, and that's why, <clears throat> that's why it's important to, um, you know, sort of outline 
the the control the the dynamic the and the the context and the consequences um once the context changes i think the whole um, approach to therapy would change uh, the dynamic uh, that was so easy quite easy for i would say um, like um, a chairperson pointed out that you know it it represents a kind of subtle ipv and which is why i chose this case because we often come across the kind of uh, clients that we are referring to where uh, there are more the context is much more complicated there's financial dependence there are children involved um, there are other you know codependence involved it's very difficult to extract the client literally from the abusive relationship um, but that's exactly what um you know the first part of the therapy is about to understand what kind of violence is this is this characterological violence is this um like you know um, is this the um the violence in reaction to violence that the female partner is exhibiting or is this situational violence uh, when we say situational violence that lends itself much more amenable for couples therapy because in situational violence we see that uh, both partners are engaging in uh, several forms of mildly abusive behavior that could be coming out of anger discontrol or that could be coming out of um, you know mild issues of mood regulation etc that can be corrected with couples intervention but when there is characterological abuse and characterological abuse as i said uh, can differ in terms of severity um when there is uh, when there is so much of um, power and control uh, including the kids as well the children as well the context might change because then the children become the focus they become the pivot in terms of decision making in terms of custody there might be law involved uh, you might want um, the kids to you know sort of first of all you might want safety for the kids um, to look at you know where are they are they witnessing the violence how does it how does that change their um, you know trauma footprint what kind of uh, transgenerational trauma at they being subjected to so the entire blueprint changes completely um i wanted to sort of you know focus on on the subtle case for that reason so as to be able to understand how do we start how do we sort of get the foot in the door and then sort of bring in the other complications because as you saw this is such a complex um, you know presentation there are so many there are two people involved and most often the the perpetrator and the survivor are survivors of complex ptsd and when you're dealing with two people with complex ptsd uh, the battleground is immensely complex it's not going to be easy at all there are going to be contextual factors systemic dynamics we have to keep all of that in mind the families here were you know not in mumbai so um, they had not sort of uh, you know been um involved in therapy but i'm sure that we have encountered such cases as well where clients and their families would also come up for therapy sessions and want to have conversations with us to be able to do whatever they can to either stop the violence or bring an end to the relationship or make them live peacefully um hence it's uh, you know it's important to understand that um the the context is critical we need to be able to analyze each client's presentation according to the central dynamic the context and the consequences which gives us an idea about the systemic dynamic if i may uh, abrid the, the, the <laughs> this, this question of if children were there changes the entire i mean uh, sukanya rightly said the context completely changes that is too speculative and too conjectural uh, uh, an area altogether because the entire dynamic changes and the, the personalities change all of us who have been parents will acknowledge that our personalities get affected by having children in a uh in the scenario uh the the, the uh, insights that are gained the uh, responses to stresses do change a lot so i think we, we cannot bring that very hypothetical question in, in this very well described dyad who are there we would say either by choice or by circumstance they 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 are childless and that's the way we have to deal with it it's it's a new story if there are children thank you yeah. sir sukane uh, there is a question in the chat box uh lots of clients build up stories of lies in relationship therapy so so your experience and comment on that uh sorry i could not hear the uh, the entire question lots of clients uh, lots of clients build up stories of lies in their relationship lies relationship therapy yeah well so, so how, mean... how 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 to handle this or what is your experience regarding this this you know topic? being a being a trauma therapist um 
we we cannot question the trauma that the individual sort of brings to the to the session because then we won't be able to uh, cater to the first foundation of trauma therapy which is that we don't need to know whether an event really happened or not what is important is that why is the client feeling the need to lie in the session what are they trying to conceal so even if my right brain is going to tell me this is a lie that's coming up in the session i would rather ask myself why the lie what is it that the client is trying to protect here um so i think that's critical and being a trauma therapist um, you know that um that aspect of the clinician is is very important to be able to pick up those subtle cues uh, where we think this is a lie or you know um, i would say that you know it would probably be something that will come up at a later date because i place a lot of trust in my clients even if they are not disclosing certain information i wouldn't chase it i would keep it as an observation and i would trust my client completely to bring it up to bring up the real story at a later time um that's what i have learned so far i may be completely wrong there might be other methodologies to go about it but i certainly don't feel that therapists can be lie detectors so yeah there there are quite two questions in the chat box from where somebody has asked about are there marriages that may not have power and control dynamics and how do we decide power and control dynamic is abusive hmm. is abusive you see yeah okay. how do we decide okay uh, i think the second question is pretty simple so i'll attend the first two and first uh, that's a great question that can there be marriages without power and control dynamics because we are inherently complex individuals and there is uh, you know some amount of racism sexism that is perpetuated to generations that are that we learn that we take up these roles uh, i don't think it would be uh, right to say that there can be a marriage without any power and control dynamics uh, there might be a more egalitarian kind of dynamic between two partners that can exist and that do exist you know uh, these days between partners uh, however i mean the the context is not about no con- no power dynamics or no control dynamics uh, there would be certain dynamics our our job is to understand what is it what kind of power dynamics exist the second part how do we understand the power dynamics we simply refer to the power and control wheel which is such a wonderful model that has been um, postulated it really helps us look at what are those different um, you know aspects of power and control in the relationship so we just refer to that match it to the uh, to the narrative that we are getting from the client and be able to understand what are the uh, dynamics that are at play i yeah, hope that answers the question yeah so can you how what is the presenting complaint of the clients that come to you uh, when, when they you came should... to me yeah what is the presenting complaint how why did they come to you well she had called me because she felt that uh, her husband was leaving her and she was in utter despair and she wanted to work on herself or to be able to save the marriage either of that so she was in a fight of life mode kuch karna hai marriage ko bachana hai ya mujhe bachana hai that was the kind of distress call that i got um however when they came like i said uh, by the time she was able to come for the session it was about 5 days later um maybe 7 days later um, you know after the first call that had come that had happened since it wasn't a crisis intervention session i could defer it 7 days um, afterwards uh, but when they came the context had changed because when she had made the call the context was different when they came for the session the context has changed changed by that time because you know it was a very volatile situation that uh, he was in uh, so by the time they had come the despair had come down a little bit because of course that sense of uh, you know codependence was there oh he's back in the relationship that was the that was where she was um and he had joined the session because he wanted to obviously exert control over what's what she going to share with the therapist what is what is therapy going to do to uh, to this equilibrium that they have so that was a kind of control that was already there right from the first session so that's how um, you know they had come for the first session and, and supplementary uh, what are the usual complaints matlab patients kaise aate hain aapke paas jo jo Uh, other patients uh, what is the usual usual range of complaints that they come to you so it can range from clinical depression to somatic wake somatic complaints <clears throat> to they suddenly realizing uh, you know not um, 
not suddenly, maybe over a period of time, sort of realizing that they want to work on the trauma. They want to be able to reach a decision. They have been in that ambivalent mode for a very long time. So like I said, that research has also identified that women do realize, even partners, male partners also realize that they are in an abusive relationship. It's not that they have a blind spot. They are able to realize that this is an abusive pattern in most cases. However, they also realize that their ambivalence prevents them from walking out of the relationship. And they feel uh, very strongly attached to the partner. And that is what they come up with because they're constantly in an approach avoidance conflict. That ambivalence is not a good place to, to live in. And that constant trauma is what they're battling day in and day out. And that's what they usually come with. They, and you know that can range from feeling extremely helpless uh, to feeling depressed, to having a lot of mood swings, to having aches and pains, somatic complaints, headaches, host of that. So trauma, of course, like um, I think um, in the first um, uh, Thursday musing that I covered that you know, trauma uh, gets manifested in several ways, not just in terms of emotions, but also in terms of bodily sensations. So one might have a host of somatic complaints and uh, yet not be able to link it to the, um, to the presenting uh, you know, emotional disturbance. Yeah, thank you. Amrit. Yeah, like Dr. Bhede sir was uh, pointing out that the narcissism element sir was not very, very, you know, comfortable with the fact that there is an element of narcissism in the whole uh, context of what you had presented. But now if there is, uh, we are asking questions from the chat box, whatever question that is coming. So uh, there is a question which asks how to manage and cope with a narcissistic partner. So how to deal or how do, what do you um, tell your clients who have a narcissistic partner? That's again a great question because there is no clear-cut answer to that. And of course, therapy with a, with a person with narcissistic personality can be very, very complex. Um, if, if I can recommend the work of uh, a particular um, author, uh, Valkins, he has worked uh, a lot on therapy with narcissistic personality disorder. Um, so he says that the continuum of the cluster B personalities, borderline, narcissistic and then antisocial or psychopaths so he says that uh, narcissistic borderlines are basically um, you know borderline personalities are basically personalities who didn't move on to become narcissistic personalities so so in order to be able to treat the narcissistic personality the narcissistic defense has to be first attacked and they have to be brought down to the borderline level then be able to sort of you know engage in therapy because at the narcissistic level it's impossible to break through that um, you know um, defense because that is such an excellent defense it it serves such a great purpose when you think of celebrities with narcissism um, you know when you think of well known people with narcissistic uh, personality disorders as well um, narcissism helps them achieve so much that you know it's it's a good thing to actually uh, be in for them so they wouldn't give it up for anything in the world perhaps so it's very difficult to treat narcissistic personality um, but there are therapies there are ways where uh, partners who are in a relationship can also be um, engaged in therapy to sort of you know be in the relationship and be able to fulfill the needs of the narcissistic partner as well narcissistic personality is not a one zero um, kind of combination uh, it's a matter of degree so if if the if the severity is not that much if the if the partner is you know sort of um, able to engage in some form of um, you know with the, with the therapy session also then there is some scope of working with the narcissism involved in the narcissistic defense but of course it's a very difficult condition to treat the prognosis is not that great um, there are um, uh, there are some great uh, books to refer to. There is Disarming the Narcissist, where um, Behari talks about schemas that uh, that the narcissistic personality has, and um, uh, we sort of, you know, we would we would have to how keep how we can work about uh, the narcissistic complex, the narcissistic defenses, the schemas that underlie them uh, in a gradual manner. So um, it requires a lot of training in several forms, schema therapy, trauma therapy, to be able to work with a narcissistic uh, personality. Uh, but of course, um, you know, um, it's, it's first important to be able to diagnose it correctly. 
because sometimes the covert narcissism that um, that we talk about that bihari talks about is may not be all that easy to spot overt na- narcissism is easy to spot but covert narcissism may not be something that is easy to spot so it's important to know what are the assessments to be able to place how workable this uh, kind of presentation is uh, be able to understand the kind of uh, trauma that the intimate partner might be going through um and also you know having the sense of agency in the uh, partner as well whether they might be wanting to go through that that is also critical to uh, analyze dr bhede sir you wanted to add something take minute sir yeah, you wanted no, to I, add I, something no sir? i i agree with uh, that take but i just just felt that uh, why did we leave out one particular cluster b personality histrionic personality we spoke about borderline we spoke about histrionic sorry we did not speak about histrionic we spoke about npd and we spoke about aspd uh, i don't buy this bit about having to bring down the narcissistic personality down to a borderline level the borderline is something you definitely want to avoid and the the right word which uh, sukanya used in terms of attacking the narcissistic defenses i think this has to be done uh, the, the attack so to say has to be very very subtle it it has to be accepting the narcissist getting the narcissism narcissist to accept narcissistic traits in himself is a huge task it, it, nobody generally wants to acknowledge any cluster to be uh, malfunctioning uh, traits so getting them to see that part of themselves is a challenging but attainable task for the determined therapist and i think therapist variables are tremendously important in that kind of situation how how to deal with a narcissistic life partner was the basic question i think uh, sukanya answered it adequately by saying that it's very challenging and not the prognosis is not generally very great yeah thank you sir thank you sir so can there is a request in the chat box uh, what is the uh, can you suggest some books or resource material on this topic yeah there are so, several books um, there's disarming the narcissist is a wonderful book for uh, for both therapists and um, um, partners as well who are living with a narcissistic partner Uh, by behari so that is based on uh, you know the concept of schema therapy narcissism i found it a very useful book to actually not only go through but also suggest to some of my clients as well um for you know bibliotherapy and uh, also for uh, you know sort of it has very useful tools to identify overt and covert narcissism uh, there are other uh, books as well um, which uh, one which is by balkins um, i think it's called um, uh, i'll i'll get i'll get the name across so there are a couple of books which can be recommended uh, for our clients um which are very very useful for them to understand what is this narcissism about and for them to also be able to accept that they are probably living with a narcissistic partner because that's also equally uh, challenging because uh, narcissism is not um you know it's it's a um, demonized word so the moment we call someone as narcissistic it has a lot of repercussions in terms of the tag that is getting attached to them uh, so we also need to avoid that demonizing uh, that partner the narcissistic partner and uh, be able to respectfully communicate what is it that we are uh, noticing as clinically significant in them yeah there is a question is codependence good in relationship not at all but unfortunately uh, you know relationships work with that lock and key mechanism so there would be some amount of codependence um, but when we say codependence what we essentially mean is codependence is an unhealthy form of dependence so when we look at it as a spectrum uh, there is always dependence that is the whole idea of a healthy relationship that we will be dependent on the partner to a certain extent but when it veers towards an unhealthy pattern that is what is known as codependence so that is definitely not desirable it needs to be brought down to the dependence level so alin can we change the perspective a little this side how do you yeah. do, deal with reverse power and control when the woman is the abuser so most uh, therapists uh, who work with narcissistic abuse or who work with uh, power and control issues or you know ipv sort of say that just do the math uh, in the opposite manner but of course the context will become different because this, the social roles will be different um the you know the the, the male partner might feel overly dominated by the female and there would be certain other social stereotypes as well there could be a lot more sense of shame 
um, in the male partner that they are not only being able to uh, save themselves or you know secure their safety but also not being able to fulfill a social role of having the woman in control so it sort of goes against the male stereotype that we are all kind of subjected to so there can be additional shame there can be additional uh, sense of uh, you know failure sense of blame self blame as a partner so those are important um, again very important uh, issues to sort of navigate carefully in therapy because when we are looking at a reverse uh, equation uh, although i haven't worked with that kind of a couple yet uh, where i have found the female uh, to be and that's kind of uh, reflected in literature as well that uh, most of the ipv um, couples that have been found are heterosexual with the male to female aggression happening much more than the female to male aggression happening yeah yeah uh, regarding taking up from the question that dr sagar had put uh, there is a comment suppose uh, we discover this uh, ipv is going on and one of the, the the sufferer is not coming out is not ready to report or so what do we do as a professional mm, can you repeat the question again the, the person who is the person who is actually not the ready target, to report yeah and uh, suppose she is not ready to come out she is partially accepting smiling on that okay chalta hai so so what is our role there our our uh, role there as a therapist or a uh, uh, intervening person so um, in such cases what we see is that um, usually what is um, you know expected is that when there is any kind of aggression the nervous system is going to get uh-huh. into a fight or flight response so either the individual uh-huh. will get out of that uh, situation or they might um, engage in fighting back so when they are sort of you know um, um, coming out with a response which is more about giving into the situation or handling it in a light manner we know that it's not an appropriate response but at that moment in that context probably that's their survival response so we cannot entirely take away or invalidate that survival response one of the things most important uh-huh. tenets of trauma therapy is uh-huh. that we uh, we need to respect the current response that the client is engaging in because that's serving a survival function so we we do not need to invalidate it but it's important to um, to sort of acknowledge the function of that response that must be serving uh, you know helping the client survive at the moment and then gradually enter into their defenses be able to you know sort of build more agency sense of agency as, assess safety in their environment whether any other mode would be suitable for them or not so which is why the context is important uh, we cannot just out of the blue teach the client to engage in a particular fight response or flight response because the context might not allow that and that might aggravate the problem as well so um, also of course you know as clinicians we sometimes might get too attached there can be counter transference also happening we need to be acutely aware of that um, and uh, you know we we need to sort of understand that we cannot get into the rescuer complex we also need to be able to take care of our own trauma as therapists as well we don't uh, you know um, we don't sort of get um provoked with our own trauma and try to rescue the client as well because after all it is the client's agency that we need to retain but I like i said that it's also important to supply the client with uh, helpful helplines numbers let them know about resources they can get in touch with the moment they change their mind the moment there is a tip in the balance they can reach out to agencies who can be of help 24/7 it's important to give them those resources probably some pamphlets etc which is why i feel that this topic needs to be um something that is talked about much more that is acknowledged by not only the mental health fraternity but also other uh, you know non mental health fraternity as well the medical fraternity as such so that it's acknowledged it's understood the severity is understood and uh, we are able to sort of intervene at a much earlier time so probably an early detection might be a better way of preventing you know later forms of severe violence i think i think that is quite reasonable can we also add a line that any sort of violence is a criminal offense or it is not to be done it is uh, is tarah se matlab indirectly psycho education yeah psycho educate in that manner that any any sort of violence is not acceptable it is a bad thing or criminal or something absolutely 
absolutely we we do need to let our clients know that in case we feel that our clients are not aware of the legal frameworks and uh, you know the uh, the decision making power that they have but at the same time they usually fall on the uh, you know on a deaf ear because they they almost know about it but like i said that they acknowledge that they are in abusive relationship the abuse is not something that they deny mostly uh, but at the same time they recognize that they feel powerless they are feeling helpless to move out they cannot move out they're so attached to it yeah with uh, sir better sir with with regard to uh, legal recourse it's very uh, it's relatively easy when you have physical abuse with emotional abuse the most difficult area to define and study is emotional abuse whether with children or in the context of uh, intimate partner violence emotional abuse is very difficult to define and convince any legal authority for instance that it was going on it's it's a huge huge challenge i deal with emotional abuse of children but i think uh, in the ipb context it's it's equally you said violence should not be tolerated you say that violence is a bad thing physical violence usually not a problem just have to gather enough evidence emotional no matter how much evidence you give the courts do not accept it the police never accept it yeah rightly said uh i think i think we have covered most of the questions so uh, we'll move to chair persons for their comments and uh, any observations and any any uh, contribution they want to make chair persons bide sir and dr sagar sagar you want to go first unmute so sir you go i have done it so i think we had a very meaningful session i again compliments to kanya on uh, bringing to light a much neglected theme uh, no matter how many times i say it it's still not over emphasized it, it is given the due uh, importance and i congratulate the uh, organizers for bringing uh, uh, the, 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 somewhere where the light is very seldom shed by our profession social sciences focus a lot on this but clinicians don't pay adequate attention to this as a phenomenon and uh, i was delighted to be here and uh, to uh, chair this uh, wonderful session i think we've had a very meaningful dialogue i want to address the outrage and indignation that uh, rukshida has been uh, feeding to us <laughs> through the uh, column and i i agree that uh, we we can't smile through ladies who say chalta hai hone do i i think especially since we have a feminist therapist over here making the presentation today i think we should take a gentle but firm stance you handle that very very well i must say that that while not being dismissive of that uh, survivor uh, uh, let's say coping style uh, we we have to eventually bring this to light that this should not be tolerated in the long run so we should that we are we as therapists uh, you were rightly shocked we are we are not accepting this as a uh, right modus operandi at all but we have to be gentle in uh, helping them traverse the uh, ground to their recognizing their rights and uh, asserting them thank you alim uh thank you amrit and very very particularly thank you tofan for having us over here on behalf of sagar and myself we thank you for giving us this opportunity uh, tofan sir yes <clears throat> it has been a marvelous session and this fantastic second coming of sukanya and where dr ajit left this is an important issue with clinicians never pay importance to although we face it on and off on and off we face these problems and it has been a very good deliberation by sukanya on the topic and it has ignited many minds and the and she has also shared the books and i think she will be also sharing some questions if it is mailed to her as after leave of this meet thank you alim and amrit for five conducting the moderation very well as always ajit thank you thank you very much and shagar thank you very much for all your inputs so i would give a formal thank you from the ips odisha state bench thank you sukanya you were wonderful exhaustive difficult so many facets so many angles to the case so every case is unique every case is different and it did not trigger any kind of emotions that you expected except that it triggered a lot of emotions 
against me i see a lot of things uh, in the chat box let, let me clarify a question i asked to you i told if a child comes to us with some issues and then we find out that he or she has abusive parents and then when we ask the mother or the of the child that what is happening and she smiles and tells you don't get into it so how do we deal such cases like some people have commented that we are smiling on these things and appreciating these things this is absolutely wrong we have recordings of everything so that is one controversy that has been created and and, and i am i am little taken back by all these things but i think we are doing all a lot of work i have done a study on women violence now in the post covid 19 which is published on psychiatric clinical neurosciences so thank you dr bhide sir in spite the colgate man always smiling he brought a different angle to the whole uh, topic thank you so much sir from giving your valuable mm -hmm. time dr sagar lavaniya sir you are so well dressed we are impressed by your dressing sense and he came with a phone call thank you his tie is on is looking good that's what dr ranjan is telling thank you dr tufan sir always guiding us thank you rucha sazia and sharda they have helped us a lot thank you torrent at the end i would like to thank ips osb for supporting us helping us and giving us a free signal and for a change alim was good today thank you so much <laughs> thank you thank you amit i think uh, gurnani sir is there if he wants to uh, say something sir you have to unmute yourself gurnani sir please unmute yourself hi hello hello everyone Th thanks for inviting me to sitiki it's nice that i'm having a one to one talk with also senior persons and beloved ones i just want to say that many attempts i have come across many patient for example i would like to say one couple the lady they had married in a law marriage and the boy was so torturing to her i'm sorry to say but that he will sprinkle salts on the private parts to enjoy the sex and the girl was so horrified at the sight or at the imagination that she will have to go in the bed with him but still she could not manage to take her out from that relationship i tried to convince her many times that why don't you call your parents she won't even inform to her parents that what's happening to her because for the guilt that she had gone for a love marriage so many times many some situations come where we are not able to anything and another question what one just came that uh, that i would say that there is a non assertive behavior that the, what sagar said that the lady would just smile and uh, she won't say anything or will not comment anything that why the husband is torturing her so one the answer i would like to give to that is that i said non assertive behavior if being tolerated for many a times for months together ultimately it will lead to aggressive behavior and that relationship is going to be end in a divorce or separation so non assertive behavior what you say that you are just smiling you may take it in a traumatic situation in a different way but in a behavioral school we would call that behavior as a non assertive behavior and non assertive behavior is always a defeatist behavior which is always going to end in a yes, defeat so that just really has to be defeated and it has to be discouraged that's what i would like to just say thank you thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir thank you everyone bide sir dr sagar sukanya thank you so much for uh, being with us again i think it was a wonderful session tufan pati sir thank you amrit tum gayab ho gaye ho to thank you in absentia so i think <laughs> uh we can wind up the session now acha okay we should close the session now tofan sir if you allow yes 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 okay sir yeah. good night I everybody will. i'll uh, close it from my side thank you everybody good night everybody thanks ajit delighted very nice again a sample of those smiles <laughs> <laughs> okay